right, it's good afternoon. Good afternoon. So again, thank you to, to, to Benny uh, and everyone else who has helped uh, put this conference together. Uh, very excited to be presenting uh, my work here on sustainability. Uh, so this is my first project in this area, uh, and in a, in a minute or two I'll explain uh, why or how I ended up in, uh, working in this space. So this is co-authored work with Dane Christensen, who is at the uh, University of Oregon, and George Serafim, who is also at uh, Harvard Business School. So in fact, I think George was the one that was supposed to be presenting, but he sort of sent his uh, junior lieutenant uh, to be able to, to come present. And so this, uh, uh, as you can see from the title, we are looking at this idea of now as we think about uh, sustainability, as we think about especially ESG, we now need to be thinking about you know, what does it actually mean, but from one thing that uh, Carl has really sort of pointed or alluded to, there is so much disagreement, or at least we still don't really understand uh, how to measure or how to really think about assessing uh, ESG. And so in this paper, we, we look at you know, what are the drivers uh, of the, the disagreement that we may actually see in the ESG ratings. And one of the reasons why we think you know, it matters to be able to really think about what ESG is all about is because ESG is something that is being used a lot. So if we maybe sort of just you know, start to think about where do we see ESG being used, or at least the ESG ratings and the ESG data. So we already have some data, I think, that sort of cow has already brought up in, in terms of you know, the, the amount of money that is actually being put in, uh, at least the amount of uh, money or assets under management that uses some form of ESG. So here are just sort of two quick examples. So if you go back to the principles of responsible investment, they talk about you know, more than $60 trillion that is being invested with some consideration of ESG. So this is not to say they're investing in companies that are sort of ESG focused, but at least as they're making decisions on how to make these investments they're considering some issues related to uh, sort of environmental, social, and governance matters. Uh, and then also, one of the things that came up, I think the example of Calpers, where they, 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 they make this statement that if you're, if you're a private fund manager who is going to come to some of these pension funds looking for money, that you're then going to invest independently and you sort of provide some, uh, some returns to them. So most of these pension funds, uh, so the example that I hear is from South Africa, so the, this is the government on or the pension fund. They actually now require all the private fund managers that come to them looking for financing to articulate what their policies for ESG uh, you know, are. And this is something that is happening throughout the world. And then also, the one thing that makes me very excited, especially with, with this topic, I, I do a lot of work in debt markets. Uh, so I look at bank loans, what happens in, in that space, I also look at corporate ratings, so most of my research is in uh, credit ratings. Uh, so one of the things that we have now started to see is that when you go get a loan, so some of these loans can actually now uh, be determined based on ESG ratings. So this example, for example, that I have here, it, it's a covenant in the loans that there could be adjustments to the interest that a company pays based on how that company does on ESG indicators. And if this statement had continued from the Wall Street Journal, uh, so you could actually see that the, this bank would not do its own rating uh, for the ESG. It will rely on third party uh, ESG ratings, which is sort of one of the things that uh, this paper is going to be, to, to be about. But obviously, you know, this slide will not be complete without credit rating agencies. So now these are the regular credit rating agencies that we sort of t tend to think of. So we have you know, S&P Global, we have Moody's, we have Fitch, and now one of the things that is happening in this space, and this is really what pushed me to sort of consider spending time understanding what's happening with ESG, is if we were to go back to 2017, S&P will say that about 10% of their ratings were based on some form of ESG considerations. And then if you look at Fitch, so 22% of their 22,000 ratings we're actually based on some form of ESG ratings. Uh, so this is not saying you know, ESG is a big part or ESG is now uh, a separate thing that they're considering for these ratings, but as they look at each individual company, they look at the entities, they're going to be thinking about where does this company or where does this entity stand with respect to, uh, to ESG. And beyond that, 
Uh, so some of you may already know uh, Moody's uh, and S&P have now invested or have bought or acquired some companies that were purely ESG rating agencies. So now they're really moving all in into thinking about how do we actually do our ESG ratings. And there's also a lot of money that people are spending to just be buying data. So this is data, not necessarily ratings. It could simply be acquiring data that allows you to learn about how a company is performing in ESG. So there, uh, this is in between 2014 and 2018, there's been about 200 to $500 million that people have spent just buying this data. And I think this number is going to be you know, even uh, bigger, uh, depending on how you look at you know, what people actually are spending it on. So as you sort of think about you know, this information or sort of all you know, the usage, the amount of money that's going into this, then the question is, do we understand what this is? Uh, and uh, I think, again, from what we've already had this morning, there is a lot of disagreement. You know? So we really don't know what these things are, what ESG is. And for those that have started to provide some ratings, they don't quite disagree. So one of the things that come up, if you read the Wall Street Journal, you read the Financial Times, and you listen to the SEC commissioners talking about ESG, the story is the same, that you know, what are we learning? Why is there so much disagreement between ESG ratings? And so one of the things that people have made, uh, they've sort of compared this to is, if you think about credit rating agencies, when they give ratings or assign ratings for the credit risk of an issuer, they tend to really sort of move together. You know, there's some disagreement, but in general, they tend to be you know, very close to each other. But if we look at ESG ratings, there is a lot of uh, disagreement, or rather, in this case, there's very little overlap. And so there is a concern, and the concern here is if there is a lot of disagreement, uh, and perhaps if we really don't understand what's happening there, then these ratings are at risk of just, you know, not being trusted uh, by investors. Uh, you know, so again, this is one thing that we don't quite test to sort of see in this paper whether you know, who is using it, how people are trusting them, but there is this risk that people have expressed that if we don't know what they are, there's still so much disagreement, maybe there's going to be a problem. And so what we do in this paper, uh, or at least we sort of step back and say, let's sort of try to understand what's driving uh, this disagreement. So our research question, uh, I guess there are two in one. One is, you know, so to what extent does the firm's disclosure and also just its average performance of ESG affect this rating disagreement. And uh, so we're just going, you know, we were trying to sort of find out as to what really makes these providers disagree. And we think one is the disclosure that the companies are providing. Uh, and also, if you look at you know, some literature that I found that, you know, depending on whether someone is performing well uh, or someone is performing very poorly, so if you have sort of some of those extremes, then we can also see disagreement happen. Uh, so I will go, you know, we'll talk about this as we go to the results. Uh, but very briefly, so this is you know, a map of where the results are, are going to be. So if we were to just look at this uh, left-hand side here, if we were to put companies in sort of these test aisles, uh, companies in the lower test aisle for disclosure in terms of how much disclosure they provide going all the way to the high, you see that the, the disagreement, which are the numbers in, uh, in the middle here, actually grows as the disclosure grows as well. And then if you're going on the other side where you have the performance, so is this a company that is performing well, uh, or gets sort of the high there, or is it performing poorly? And then you also see that the, the, the disagreement, uh, you know, in the middle there's really not much disagreement compared to the, to, to the edge. So if you're a poor performer or a very good performer, there tends to be some disagreement. So we'll talk about that as well. Uh, but a big part is you're looking at sort of this, if you are a very poor performer, but you have a lot of disclosure, which is sort of this number, the 17 point, I guess I can use the point of it, the 17.9 here. So this is sort of where the biggest disagreement happens. A lot of disclosure, but you know, people don't just think you're a very, you know, not a good company uh, with respect to, to ESG. So this really sort of summarizes what, uh, we, what we find and also what we do uh, in this way. Now, why do we end up doing here or what do we think is actually driving this? In other words, sort of what is the, the, the hypothesis here? Or I guess maybe this is going to be, you know, I think we had this discussion at lunch, is in general, you expect disclosure to actually help rather than to, to increase uh, disagreement. But why does that happen? So, the, you know, our hypotheses are created or motivated by an, an, a number of issues, uh, things. So the first part is, 
is we think about how are people actually going to be making decisions about this uh, you know, there's You're looking at statements that people understand, and you also have to actually sort of make a judgment on, on certain things. And so what happens with ESG disclosure is it, the, it's something that is just new. So we really don't have, for the most part, a benchmark. So if I give you financial leverage for the financial statements, uh, you know, we sort of now understand what leverage means. Uh, but if we go to ESG as information, there are some things there that we still don't understand what they mean. So as we are making judgments or as analysts, there's, there's a tendency that we are going to disagree on certain things. And so with, with that in mind, so there's a lot of literature in psychology, in sociology, that sort of looks at the way that we are going to evaluate something uh, is going to be driven by sort of how much we all have been in, you know, somehow at least you know, be, you know, be, be, become familiar with, with, with the concepts. And in this case, this is new, so we are not really familiar with, with what's, what's happening. Uh, and also, we are not really part, you know, as analysts for ESG, there is no association that people can go and really learn from each other. So people are sort of learning on their own. Uh, and so they're coming up with rules of thumbs. And so for that reason, there's going to be a lot of disagreement especially as I give you more information. Because as I give you more information, there's going to be a lot more for you to disagree on. At least that's sort of one of the things that uh, we think about. And we can talk about that uh, in the, the Q&A, is sort of you know, what, you know, what your thoughts may be as well. So our first hypothesis is going to be, as the disclosure increases, we are also going to see uh, the disagreement uh, increasing as well. And then <clears throat> this will give you at least a sense of, if I were to just take this and you know, pick a random company, uh, let's look at the disclosure that this company provides. So most companies will provide these CSR reports. Uh, you know, so in this one, the work day in 2014, well, this is the report based on 2012, at about 58 pages. And then if you go to 2015, the report grew to 94 pages. And if we are looking at the difference or what happens between these two years with respect to the disclosure scores that Bloomberg will provide, so the we expect this to go up because now information you know, just by count of the pages. So that's what we find with the Bloomberg here. And then when we look at the ratings itself, so Thomson Reuters, so this is the asset for that uh, we, we saw in the first paper. So the environmental score and the social score uh, both go up. And for the, M, uh, so the Morgan Stanley here index, the environmental goes down, the social goes up, and then Sustainalytics, there's no change in the environmental and the social rating goes up. So this is just to illustrate that you know, for the same report, uh, there is actually sort of, there are some differences in terms of what uh, the rating agencies are providing. And here, the rating agencies are these three. That, these are the three that are going to be used. Thompson Reuters, um, MSCI, and Satellitics. There are some that we can use, but we choose to use these ones, because I think these are sort of the biggest ones they provide, the most data we can find. So just to give you a sense of, you know, we are going to expect some differences for the same company, for the same information. Uh, and then if you look at the second hypothesis, or at least sort of the second test is, how well is the company performing? So if you look at some of the literature in the analyst focus, uh, when, when there is sort of uh, complexity in a task, when analysts are looking at one company, they, if there is more information, they're actually going to, to agree a little bit more. But what usually happens is, at the extreme ends, there is also going to be a disagreement. If you look also at the rating, credit ratings, so there is evidence that suggests that companies that tend to have the poor uh, credit ratings or companies that tend to have better credit ratings, there is also tend to be more disagreement at those extremes. Uh, and again, this is something that you know, it's sort of a few people have actually done research on. So using some of this literature that we find, which is in a sense, sort of suggests this idea of there's going to be a non-linear uh, relationship in how uh, companies are rated. We formulate our second hypothesis, although we sort of don't know where this hypothesis is going to go. So it's actually going to be as your performance for ESG, uh, you know, your performance for ESG may or may or may not affect this rating disagreement. Uh, that allows us to at least sort of see, you know, which direction it goes without really committing ourselves to, uh, to, to, to anything. Now the variables that we use. So the big part is disagreement. What is ESG disagreement? Uh, the main thing, the main uh, measure that we use here is the standard deviation. 
of FM's ESG ratings. And these ratings are created from the, the, the three measures, are the three rating agencies that I showed you. Uh, and then we are going to look at disclosure. Uh, in this case, disclosure is a score that we get from Bloomberg. So we are looking at Bloomberg as a score that allows us to just sort of look at all the disclosures that the company actually provides. So the company can provide disclosures through 8Ks, the 10Ks, conference calls, they can provide disclosure through de uh, dedicated CSR reports, uh, and Bloomberg is taking all these scores and taking all this information and creating a score that will show us, or at least tell us how much disclosure a company has. And that's going to be our measure of disclosure. And then our measure of ESG performance is simply going to be the average. Uh, across all the different providers of uh, the ESG ratings. So yeah. Just one question. Mm -hmm. Some of these providers say that the uh, industry adjusts their numbers. Okay, yeah. Um, and so then it's important that the different providers that you're looking at are all using the same industry classifications. So I just I guess one of the questions is are, are, mm -hmm. are these industry adjusted and are they using the same industries across the different vendors? Uh, so Ideally, that's sort of what we, what we want, right? Where we say for the same company, you're all looking at, the, you're classifying that company. I'm not at all clear that, that, I that, don't, that they're industry adjusting, and I, don't, I cannot back up what industry classifications they're using. So we, one thing we do when we go to the empirics is we try to, to use industry weights, because they sort of have weights for the pillars, and then they have weights for the industries. Uh, and then we also, you know, we do some industry fixed effects, and so we do a number of things at least to try to get this idea of are you making sure that for each company, for each entity, whatever we're looking at is actually based on the, the right industry. So I guess are you using their Z scores, which are their adjusted based on their ratings, or are you using the raw data? I'm just not clear. Uh, so we're using what? Uh, so for asset four, for example, we use the ESG score. Uh, so that is just the raw score that goes from the zero to, to one hundred. That's a, that's, a, that's a weighted score based upon a bunch of things. Yeah, yeah. So we so we use the so it's it's it's, it's a weighted score based. On, so if we we get this the the, S, the E score plus the S score plus the G score, and then we talk we we are taking so those three and we are creating a measure that becomes the ESG score. We ignore the economic score because they also have some of these other scores. But is, I don't think we are using it the same way that you. Uh, that you do, where you actually do some adjustments as well, or you sort of check the C score. Okay, yeah. And then for one of these, which is the uh, MSI, uh, let's see, because one of them ranges from 0 to 10, so what we then do is sort of scale it up to, to from 0 to 100. So all of them are sort of the scores that whatever the ESG score is, that is ranges from 0 to 100. Uh, we don't do any adjustment, uh, but you know, when we go to the test, we can sort of see some of the things that we do to at least make sure that we are trying in some way to make sure that there is, we are taking into account the weighting uh, that may happen for each industry and the weighting that may also happen for each pillar. Because if, once you go into each pillar, there are sort of specific indicators that are going to contribute to, uh, to, to, to this goal. Uh, and so if we were to just go to the main test uh, in this case, uh, so we find that the ESG disclosure on average is associated with greater disagreement. Uh, so if we were to sort of put this in some economic terms, if we look at just the one standard deviation, uh, for each one standard deviation increase in ESG disclosure is going to be associated with about 11% increase in uh, the disagreement. And that number is even slightly bigger for the ESG average, which is going to be about 23% change or increase in the uh, ESG disagreement. And again, so we look at this on the ordinary squares regressions. We do that also in the uh, firm fixed effects to sort of show that even just within the firm, uh, that is the firm is changing its disclosure from year to year or from, you know, whatever, however they present that disclosure, it's actually going to, to lead to the same outcome as well. And then we also look at the changes model to try to get to this idea of, you know, is this something that's just going to be uh, cross firms or is it something that maybe, you know, we are not claiming causality at least here, but we are sort of trying to sort of get closer to, to what that could be. Uh, and then if you look at sort of the individual pillars, so one of, you know, so these tests here are looking at just in general, uh, if we're looking at ESG in total. Uh, but now if we were to go to, I guess I'm going too far here. This is where going backwards becomes important. Let's see. 
Uh, so now, if we were to say, so for disclosure itself, so disclosure can actually be disclosure for the E, just the same way that the rating itself can be a rating for just the, the E or the S or the, the G. So we try to sort of say, you know, which of these disclosures is going to be driving the disagreement? Are people disagreeing more uh, because there is a lot more disclosure on the environmental issues, or is there more disclosure on the social issues, or more on the governance issues? And what we find here is that, is, you know, maybe we can go into sort of the fan fix effect, which is the middle part here. Uh, so the, the social score and the environmental score is going to actually, for, for disclosure, is going to drive greater disagreement. But when there's more disclosure on the governance, at least you know, it, with these fan fix effects within the firm, we don't see any disagreement happen. Uh, and the same happens when you go to the to the changes model, but in the all so the ordinary squares, we are sort of finding some of these results. So we attribute this change with, with that governance is not loading the same way to the fact that governance is something that people have been studying for a while. So maybe we do have some understanding of what some of these things actually mean when I'm given disclosure. So we can have uh, similar interpretations there. But I think you know there's something that I, uh, Carl mentioned early, early this morning that you may have to look at that environmental is actually one that they seems to be studied. So that's something I'm going to have to go back and sort of see what, 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 you know, what that could be. So again, if we were to change our, our dependent variable to not be the total ESG disagreement score, but just be for each pillar, so the environmental, the social, and the governance, these results sort of seem to hold the same way, that the disclosure for each one of these, for the given uh, indicator, is actually going to lead to even greater disagreement. Uh, and to be able to at least get to some causality, we look at uh, the different countries now have required that companies actually provide ESG disclosure. So as we look at, I think it's about 30 or so countries uh, all over the world that at different points in time, either as a country or as an exchange, have required that all the companies associated with them provide some ESG disclosure. So if we look at that uh, as some instrument here to sort of provide a change or an exogenous shock to disclosure, what happens? So we actually find that with mandatory disclosure, we then, you know, we're going to continue to see this disagreement happen. So it gives us some assurance that there is, you know, maybe something close to what the causality could be, but at least this idea that disclosure is indeed uh, causing some of this uh, disagreement. <coughs> Uh, and now, so one of the things, so I wanted to sort of show this picture is, is we're you know, talking about this, you know, ESG, we are talking about what, you know, how we look at, at, at companies, whatever information they provide, but the one thing that we then sort of, we, at least that we're trying to explore, so this is not in the paper, that uh, the draft that you have seen, is this idea of, you know, what, what about ESG that we care about? Is it the policies or the outcomes? And also, if we were to look at, uh, you know, creating or at least refining the hypothesis that we just tested here. If we look at the disclosure, are the companies disclosing inputs? Are the companies disclosing outputs or outcomes? So when I say inputs, it could simply be they say, we have a policy on gender diversity, since gender is something that we've been talking about all day. Uh, or they can say, we have 20% or 25% of our board being female. Yeah, or some, an outcome could simply be we have won an award for being the best place for women to work. Right, so if you're looking at the type of things that they're disclosing, it, are those things then going to cause disclosure? So we think that if the rating agencies are using uh, inputs to judge the companies and the companies are disclosing inputs, there should not be that much disagreement. Because you, know, you have a policy, you have a policy, okay, we, did, we agree. But if there's an outcome or an output, then we have to judge whether that outcome or that output is really meaningful. So those are some of the things that at least we're sort of going back now and thinking about what is it actually that's making this disclosure lead people to disagree. And we think sort of this matrix here is at least sort of going to you know, give us some form of a guide in terms of what is being disclosed, what is being used, and what actually can drive the disagreement. And if companies, so I guess if you think of the implications of the study, you know, so if we think of the implication of the study, it's going to be, our companies worry that we provide information, but then people don't disagree on whether I'm a good company or a bad company. But if we can really pinpoint what type of information companies should provide, then perhaps that will provide some way of having a shared understanding of what good ESG is, if there is such a term, or what should be uh, something that companies and 
providers and investors should actually be looking at. So that would be the end of my, uh, my, my presentation. I'll leave uh, to Annette to sort of discuss, and then I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you.